Thank you, Sard, and thank you everyone for joining. And I want to thank uh, Mary Shaughnessy for uh, uh, agreeing to uh, partner with me. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Brian Stempel, who um, uh, was going to join us, um, he's uh, um, a, a great uh, attorney, does a lot of pro bono work around tech um, from Kirkland. Um, he was not able to join us today. So um, you're getting uh, two out of three, which I guess is 66%. So maybe that's not so bad. But um, uh, he was going to talk. I'm going to try to cover some of what, uh, what Brian was going to um, talk about. But we'll just uh, jump. Um, right in so the uh, there's a little bit of background and and start shared out the the deck on uh, on Mary um, uh, who I've known for I guess quite a few years now who has uh, has been I think a real innovator um, in working with um, uh, her users with, with working across the city of New York um, and and really bringing people along, which is so important with any kind of technology, and increasingly important around security. That that uh, you know, security is a collaborative pro process, and um, she has a, uh, a unique background in in um, in auditing and um, uh, uh, studying sort of compliance, um, and that's again sort of a really important part of security. Um, and as you can see, she's been uh, um, building sort of a, a broader experience um, in other uh, areas such as business process analysis, um, uh, which is uh, uh, really uh, taking off in the legal aid community. So thank you, Mary, for joining. Um, thank you. Uh, and just a little bit on Just Tech, and uh, I won't uh, bore you with it, but uh, I'll just share a little bit of my background having um, started in uh, uh, legal aid out of law school um, after spending uh, a number of years in IT um, uh, and uh, and and frankly security has been it kind of, it kind of felt like uh, it was it was left to me in a number of roles um, uh, throughout my career in legal aid um, and uh, and I, I sort of always felt like it shouldn't be just up to me and it shouldn't just be my concern and that's going to be a, I think a, a theme um, today so. Um, a little bit of a roadmap. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about some of the risks and challenges. Um, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about policies and practices, and they um, are not one and the same, but they need together. Um, uh, a little update on uh, what's happening in New York City um, on a pro bono project, um, and then um, we're hoping to um, uh, open it up um, for discussion um, to learn. Um, from each other, there's a lot of great expertise in the uh, in the legal aid community nationally, and uh, and so we will provide some perspective based on on our careers and our work um, uh, with providers. But uh, but we really want to make it richer by including you all. Um, and then a, um, a, just a, a quick list of resources that that we recommend as a at least as a as a starting place or a place to go back to for some of us who may have visited um, some of these resources in the past but have gotten tied up in in a lot of the day to day. Um, so we all heard about uh, the most recent uh, um, breach and uh, loss of data, the, the Marriott uh, um, uh, reservation system, 500 million records, including mine. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we've heard about lots of other breaches. And I think Mary and I and it, you know, certainly have, um, have been worrying about uh, the stuff, as, as many of our, our counterparts have been around uh, legal aid. And, and I think the... Um, uh, the risks um, and the and the potential impact um, sort of are underscored almost every day in the newspaper or, or on, online or um, or on uh, on TV, um, uh, and legal aid is no exception. And I don't know, Mary, if you want to talk a little bit about um, some of your uh, experience and some of what we've seen in the legal aid community in terms of uh, those risks. Um, one of the risks is just having people out on mobile mobile equipment. You know, we send our staff attorneys out to, to clinics and they use laptops, Chromebooks. And if information gets downloaded from your case management system, which is how a lot of web-based systems work, you wind up with client documents sitting around on a laptop that they may be encrypted, they may live in a cache, but they there is a risk that if that laptop disappears, someone will be able to get hold of a client document. And right. that's one thing that we worry about a lot. And, and actually, and speaking of that laptop, so California has a, a disclosure law, and so we we have to know. And I'm, I don't want to pick on California, but um, that uh, that one of our our sister organizations um, had ten laptops stolen in in 2013 that had client names and social security numbers um, on them. Now, I bet 
um, if we went across the country, we've had a lot more than 10 laptops stolen um, with data, with with drives that were not encrypted. Um, uh, ICANN, which a lot of us remember from a number of years ago, which was a, um, a really innovative uh, project out of Orange County, had um, data um, on uh, uh, from taxpayers, basically, who had used the system um, available online and, and entirely accessible that they didn't discover until 2016. Um, and again, because of California's law, they they had to disclose that. Um, uh, but I'm sure we've yeah you know, we've all heard of other cloud-based data um, uh, uh, resources that are that are basically open to um, downloading or or reviewing um, or attacking. And so um, yeah, you know, certainly we're we're not immune to it. Um, and I think we've all heard, and I know at ITC conferences or, or formerly TIG conferences, you know the the number of programs hit by ransomware um, who are targeted by phishing attacks is, um, you know, is is growing, or or certainly it's it's been a huge risk. I think people are are strengthening their their um, uh, uh, the, their training and their tools to protect against it to some extent. Um, so this was just you know sort of uh, you know obviously. One of the things that I, I we put in sort of small type here, the risks and challenges are constantly changing, and so I think part of what you know the, the takeaway here is that we um, we want to make sure that um, that this is not a, a sort of a, a, a one uh, you know do it once and be done with it, but that this is an approach. It's a um, it's building it into an organization as opposed to addressing some of the current issues and and then letting things uh, linger or or. Um, you know, sort of continue on in a in a steady state. Um, so, Mary, maybe could you you want to talk about the uh, the major uh, data risks? Sure, case management systems, particularly um, in in all of these. I one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit is is turnover. Um, if you have pro bono staff, if you if you have interns, a lot of us use interns on a regular basis to give them job experience, but also they have access to our systems. Um, well-intentioned people, you know, we're not, don't assume as we talk through this that we're, we're talking about evil people with nefarious intentions. A lot of this is well-intentioned people who are, are not paying attention to protecting information. So case management systems where, as I said, files get downloaded onto a local drive in the course of your working with them. File servers, SharePoint, Google Drive, um, data management systems, just stuff is set up for permissive access, which can make people feel like, oh, I can get my job done and I don't have to ask for help from anyone, but you're leaving information exposed. Accounting and HR systems, we're, we're not talking just about our clients' data. We're talking about our staff data. Yeah, your personal, my personal you know, I nine information, social security numbers, employment records, raises, that's out there too. Uh, donor management. Our donors want to stay private. You know, they love to give us money. They may not want everyone in the world to know that they're giving money. Uh, web presence, apps, and social media. And we we all know that our pictures and our posts can just go places we didn't intend them to. And particularly if someone puts up a client story that can lead to all sorts of trouble. Right. And, and web presence might include now online intake for an increasing mm -hmm. number of programs or some of the, the portal projects that are underway. So a lot of, a lot of data um, and, and we have had in the past certainly a lot of programs or a number of programs that have had their websites hacked, um, compromised um, as you know, like PHP exploits are developed and their applications aren't updated. So, so there's been a history of, of compromise, certainly online. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think the, um, the case management systems, um, you know, for a lot of providers, I mean, that's been a repository of data going back many years. So it's, it's an enormous trove of a very personal, privileged, um, damaging or potentially damaging information in terms of identity theft or, or prejudicing our clients. Um, so that's a massive one, and of course, um, I, I don't know too many programs that are, are very good at uh, um, eliminating uh, old documents uh, electronically. So on their file servers or SharePoint, um, those just tend to grow. So that's you know the data risk side. Um, 
Now the top ten, and 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 I think everybody probably could come up with their their own list. Uh, this is the one that that Mary and I put together. I don't know, Mary, would you uh, take the take the lead on this? Sure. The small firms with limited budgets and tech capacity, uh, the limit. We all work in a universe of limited resources and people who say that if their computers aren't starting up, the printer is jamming, their passwords need to be changed, are not focusing on your, the IT person's need to deal with the plumbing, which they don't see, which is the security. And it's so tempting once the system is up and running to just let it go. It's there. It runs. We're not going to have to think about it. And and addressing each of your systems because, as again, it's not just your case management. It's your HR. It's your file sharing. Each of those is going to have a different vulnerability. Um, mobile work environment. People take their own laptops. Um, people take their cell phones. And sometimes client data is on a on a user's cell phone. I have had conversations with immigration lawyers who have gone on vacation internationally. And what happens if someone takes that attorney's cell phone on the way back from vacation and wants to wants to examine it? You know, um, I had personally owned devices get lost. I had one attorney lose an iPad in Italy. Fortunately, we'd already had a conversation about what happens if you lose your tablet. And so I was able to wipe it remotely. Um, but you have to have that conversation with your users. Um, client-owned devices, what happens if a client who is a survivor of domestic violence has traces on her phone of contacting us and then the abuser gets hold of it? Um, and how do you educate the user? How do you educate the client to manage her own phone? As we said before, turnover, interns, and volunteers, it is really a pain in the neck to manage your user accounts. So you have not just a network account and an email account and a case management system account and a development system account. Accounts have to be turned off. They have to be disabled and then deleted on a regular basis. What that basis is is up to you, but you have to plan for it. Um, work data and work collaborations, private and sensitive data, our funders, our partners, researchers want to help us do better work for our clients. So they want to analyze data. They want to, they want to produce statistics. How we provide that information after anonymizing it is important. What, the, the, what does that anonymizing look like? For, for example, uh, giving specific addresses out could be pro problematic with you know, scarce clients because a single data point could identify a client where a heat map might not. So we think about how we provide how we share the data. And there are always demands on improving our services. Um, how that, mm -hmm. how we do that while you know, there's, a, there's always a drive to, well, let's find out more about our clients so we can talk about our client stories. But what does that look like in collecting that data from people who often feel like they don't have any way to say no about sharing something very private to them? And cloud services, spinning them up and using them is one thing. Decommissioning them is something else that you have to think about for long term. Right, and and I, you know, I, I would just add, uh, you know, a few points that if you look at this list, I think legal aid has, as compared to sort of private law firm, has sort of a broader range of risks that that they need to manage, and those those risks are are heightened. I mean, just the, the turnover in interns and volunteers. Certainly, law firms have. Students coming in in the summer, um, but legal aid. A lot of legal aid programs live on on volunteers and, and interns, and certainly a lot of the, the volunteer lawyers projects do. Um, but even those that are are more traditional, you know, staff attorney models. Um, so that that turnover presents a much bigger training challenge, a much bigger account management challenge. Um, you know, law firms don't typically turn over lots of data to to funders <laughs> or to partners. Um, so we have, um, I, I think, a harder job to manage um, uh, our security, and I, I think maybe that's that's uh, you know I remember a number of years ago one of the uh, executive directors um, uh, uh, in a conversation around case management actually thought that uh, that we were not a target um, for security risks. This was maybe five six years ago, you know, compared to big banks and large law firms and. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, um, uh, uh, she was right. 
um, that we're not it's not the immediate you know um, you know uncovering of a of a of a merger coming up and being able to uh, you know, sort of take advantage of that in the stock market. Um, but it's but it's certainly um, a trove of information and and a lot of these attacks are are not limited now to um, uh, you know to high value targets um, or what's what's valuable is changing so it's that's I, I think you know something for executive directors for for leaders I mean I think everybody um, within an organization needs to sort of appreciate um, uh, these risks and that, that legal aid is indeed um, uh, you know, significant of, of significant value, um, uh, you know, to a range of, uh, of actors. Right. So potential impacts. Um, uh, I just, you know, uh, maybe um, we'll we'll share this one. I mean, so one of the things that, uh, uh, Mary, one of the things that I think was uh, really interesting was a, a recent Supreme Court uh, decision, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania decision. Um, uh, against the University of uh, Pittsburgh Medical Center, a, a bunch of employees um, sued, and uh, it wasn't until they got to the Supreme Court that uh, basically they they you know the, the, the under state law they um, uh, recognized um, an affirmative obligation for employers to protect uh, employee data um, against uh, uh, criminal hacking. Um, and uh, and so it's we're not just talking about notification, uh, you know, cost and and basic cyber insurance. Um, we're talking about um, potentially significant tort actions, um, and uh, and that's certainly for employees. Um, it it uh, potentially you know could uh, um, happen that that our clients could sue us as well for for damages beyond the you know the notification. Um, requirements. Um, we've, you know, certainly New York. Uh, we, we we highlighted New York and California. Um, there are a lot of uh, state laws at this point, but but uh, sort of those notification rules, and now California, this this brand new act um, uh, that was uh, um, somewhat similar to the European um, uh, rules to protect um, uh, consumer privacy. Um, is is uh, going to be coming into effect in 2020, and and uh, and again, the liability is going to get um, uh, um, you know, sort of greater as it comes into effect. Uh, a number of legal aid providers are now um, uh, covered by HIPAA um, based on some of the work that they're doing. Um, so there's there's certainly a state and federal law framework that uh, is is uh, significant and becoming more so. Um, but apart from that, as Mary, you and I were you know we we're, were talking about sort of the you know the, the safety, privacy, and expense of of clients and and staff. I mean, I think there's this. Um, real need to um, uh, to take that into account. Um, uh, I mean, even legal aid attorneys and paralegals and professionals um, have very limited resources. Um, so, if your identity is stolen, um, or you're advocating um, uh, for clients or causes that are unpopular in your communities, um, your safety is is at risk. Um, and so, we we have to take that um, into account in, in how we manage um, the security of our data. And if and if, Mary, you, if you want to talk about yeah, if you are hit with uh, a ransomware, if you if you lose the ability to run your systems, you are losing the ability to serve your clients, and then your clients worry if if they call and say we need I need help and our systems are you know we're having some system problems. It's you know it it doesn't inspire trust in people who desperately need to trust us. And time and cost of recovery. Uh, uh, several years ago, we did have an episode where we had a, a ransomware attack and it took several days to come back. Thank goodness we had great backups and we test our backups. So we brought back 98% mm -hmm. of our files, but it took time and it was time that was taken away from serving our clients. I needed my stay. I needed my lawyers to look at their files. Um, and some grants and funding sources do ask now about cyber insurance and their right to do so. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I pointed out that you know, with the California disclosure laws, so I I, uh, I found those those breaches, um, you know, online. Um, uh, you know, to the extent that more of this comes out, or and maybe more of it should come out. Um, uh, you know, then the reputation of our programs starts to get hurt, and maybe even the you know sort of the legal aid, because there are a lot of people who are are not proponents of uh, representing low-income folks. So this could be 
um, uh, damaging to the general support for um, access to justice. Um, and then I guess the question is, you know, when does uh, or where does malpractice um, uh, come into play? And there's certainly a lot of articles um, on the topic in terms of, uh, of attorney ethics and responsibilities to uh, maintain client confidences, not just of, of, of specifically confidential information, but but other information that's, that that uh, a client provides us. Um, uh, so so that's that's a potential impact um, and and certainly developing area. And I think the expectations are increasing over time, and it's, you know, what could a reasonable attorney be expected to know about the security of their systems? I think that bar is getting, it's it's getting lower in that you need, you will be expected to know more because it's out there in the world as opposed to, oh, it's a specialist. I shouldn't have, why should I have known about that? Well, now you should have known about it because it's out there. Right. right. Um, so at that, that, uh, so hopefully at, at some level folks have, um, and, and for a lot of folks, this is not all new or, or maybe much of it isn't new. Um, but everybody needs to have some appreciation of, um, of some of the risks and challenges, um, that they're significant, um, uh, and, and, uh, and they need to be addressed. Um, and frankly, so, you know, one way or the other, we, we are, um, Aggravating or mitigating those risks, uh, and, uh, um, and and just in thinking about this, and I, I know uh, in New York, for instance, um, uh, with the uh, Iola Group, we've done a number of statewide surveys, and um, there are very few programs um, with any policy, tech policy, or or more than um, sort of very basic user policy. Um, and it's 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 been you know um, there's been some improvement over um, the years we we did a repeat of that survey um, this past year, um, uh, but but I I was just sort of you know in sort of thinking this through we really all have tech policies and and I think you know it's just not what we want them to be and and I think this is where um, sort of that time and attention is is really important. Um, so. Some IT risk aggravators, um, and and uh, and Mary, I don't know if you if you'd like to start. I mean, I I, I think that there's probably no no program out there that has uh, an IT budget, um, at least among the, the IT staff, that they think is, is fully <laughs> adequate. But do you want to talk about maybe some of the particular risks around um, you know the budgeting? Uh, at at the point of which you you there's a zero based budgeting but zero based budgeting does not mean you stay at zero when you build your budget you go up from zero and there has to be nutrition for the system built in right so mm. out of date and unsupported systems over time become not the oh it works we're going to leave it alone the day comes when microsoft has sunsetted an operating system in your server or TLS, the transport layer security version one, has become unsupported, and suddenly a user tries to connect to a server, and they come back and say, you know, I can't get to this, and it's this error, T something not supported. And you haven't been upgrading your server 2003 because it seemed like it was working, and suddenly it is not only not supported, it is actively, I mean, it's completely vulnerable because nothing else is going to get patched on it. Um, team resources, as I said before, if people want their passwords changed, they want the printer on jam, they want a word lesson, which keeps them going day to day, but it's not allowing the IT staff to deal effectively with the plumbing, the unseen security pieces that we need. And as the systems get more and more out of date and slower, you know, people feel like, you know, my I bought my kid a computer that's better than this, and so the staff gets depressed, the IT staff get depressed because we don't want to work with badly out of date stuff. We want our users to have appropriate equipment, and and it turns into the the just band aid approach, band aid, band aid, band aid, and then the band aids fall off. Yeah. Um, and if IT is isolated from the business, if IT is just, well, I'm going to sit here with these computers, I'm going to sit in my server room, the IT staff is isolated from what is actually happening with the business. What's going on? What kind of work are they doing? Like, where, are their, where are the resources needed? And that's also demoralizing. And IT doesn't know what to train ourselves, and we don't know what our users are going to need for training. 
Mm-hmm. And, and oh, sorry, go ahead. That that all leads to the inadequate leadership. You know, it's just the the job gets too big. The job gets too critical. The the critical failures start to overwhelm even the best intentioned staff who have not been trained because there's no budget for training. Right. And I, so I I want to just add. So at this point. Um, uh, you know, we've worked with Adjust Tech, and myself, my colleagues at Adjust Tech have, have worked with um, on assessments um, about 30 uh, different programs, um, and we've learned from lots of other programs that we work with for, in other ways. And and I think to a greater or lesser extent, all these are true in almost every organization we've worked with. And um, and I I'm um, you know sort of uh, just so impressed, frankly, by how efficient people, you know, uh, try to be with with systems and budgets that are so limited. How they really want to get everything done, um, uh, but but they they want to work on, let's say, multi-factor authentication, but they just can't get the time to set up a sandbox environment um, or or spin up a VM in Azure um, uh, for whatever the project is. They're not getting to move forward, and um, and so it is. It, it, it starts to um, feel like it's you know I'm just I'm just sort of keeping the lights on barely, um, and I think the um, you know sort of that that IT training uh, you know a number of um, of folks we've worked with I mean they're they're starving for it the IT staff um, uh, and and there's been very limited support for it um, either because they can't afford to have them out of the office. Um, or they can't; they're not going to budget for the training, and so all these things. You know, we're we're talking about the, the context of security here, but really also about good technology management. Um, and good technology management, I think, leads to better technology security, um, and uh, and leads to sort of that capacity and that looking forward um, uh, and learning about what's happening because you've got to stay on top of um, a fairly diverse set of. Um, of technologies within legal aid um, uh, and certain technologies that are outside of legal aid that may impact your ability to um, uh, to keep your um, your data and your system secure. Um, uh, I think we also see, uh, and I think we can probably all relate to executive directors, project directors, leaders who are are strapped for um, time because they've got a gazillion projects going on. They've got a lot of threats against their funding um, and uh, and frankly, not having that um, time carved out for tech um, uh, reduces the ability, um, I think, for their IT team, um, whether it's uh, uh, staff or, or outsource a, a program uh, in Ohio that that, uh, that outsourced their IT had uh, set up a weekly meeting with the executive director. Like so, they they purposely were trying to sort of shift that dynamic um, so that the ED had. Um, and had sort of that insight, had that communication, um, understood, for instance, they, they were doing a training program for staff on security awareness, and very few people were showing up. And so it gives that ED the opportunity to really um, uh, uh, you know, talk to um, uh, their colleagues and, and figure out what the, what the challenges are to getting people into training that, that, uh, that's so critical and that they were spending money on. Um, uh, you know, again, I think the, um, uh, the, the staff buy-in um, uh, if if we're not leading and we're not sort of um, uh, addressing the needs of our advocates, um, uh, then we we don't have sort of their support. And and typically, I think as which we'll see, you you end up getting a lot of workarounds, um, get uh, technology that that hasn't been vetted or or may not be easily managed or maintained. Um, uh, another uh, sort of instance, um, you know, in terms of starvation budgets, um, uh, I was meeting with a program recently that had um, an old case management system that would not run on anything, that would not work basically if it was moved to uh, anything past server 2008, and so they were stuck with the server 2008 environment. Um, uh, and so, you know, like that's a that's a challenge with out of date software, um, and and that the actual case management system itself has some major security flaws. Um, but we need we need to be able to keep moving um, sort of our IT forward and managing it well, so that we can um, uh, maintain that sort of that basic level of security and also you know maintain support from staff 
um, uh, maintain the training um, of our IT teams, um, and also sort of their focus, give them time to work on those those projects that, that move uh, security forward. So risk mitigation. Um, and certainly I think the, you know, uh, Mary, in your in your background, you know, around security, I don't know if, if you want to sort of share some some thoughts. These were a few of the you know sort of areas that that we were we were thinking about. But uh, one of the things that that works really well is is celebrating people's catches. So when people have when people get emails that look like fishes, they know to send it to me, or they can call me, they can text me, they can send me a separate email and say, I think I have this email that looks weird. I have 35 users, so we are not that big an organization, but it is always better for me to walk over to a desk, look at a fish, explain to the user why it is or is not, and that way they've learned, they feel good because they have been acknowledged as having made a good catch, and they know to keep looking. Um, one CIO of a big law firm said in, in a conversation, somebody asked him, how many, how big is the security team? And he said, my security team is the entire organization. So if you encourage and celebrate people who, you know, they see something, they say something. And even if they're wrong, which they usually aren't with fishes increasingly, they have done what we need them to do. And... I am, and, and the other side of that is the spear phishing of the, you know, the email allegedly from an ED saying, "Hey, you know, please at, please approve this wire transfer." In a small organization, the financial manager gets up, walks down the hall, and says to the ED, "Did you really send this?" But the finance manager has to feel confident that she can do that, and that the ED is not going to brush her off. And when the ED says, "No, I didn't," and thank you for catching it. Everybody is part of the security culture, and that that has been really effective here. Uh, and telling people when stuff comes out, I send an email out about once a month. Here's the latest thing that's happening. Um, my users expect it; they read them, and then they ask questions, and that that really builds the culture. Right. And you know, again, the. The tech planning. This is um, not specifically around security, but but planning your um, uh, your systems, your technology needs um, with your users, um, so that your users aren't using their own systems or their own workarounds. Really important. Or you know, to the extent that you even come up with a a basic system or 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 service that you're going to use that that fits the need, making sure that you're looking at sort of the different use cases. Are are people able to do it from a laptop or a tablet or or their smartphone? Um, so really, uh, you know, kind of digging deeper. And again, this goes back to resources. Having that time to do that, having um, uh, the that that culture that that really brings people into the discussion. Um, it's not just that we're going to, you know, uh, uh, build a uh, a mobile um, uh, first, uh, uh, you know, online intake system for clients. We we spend a lot of time, you know, in legal aid typically um, asking clients to try it out, and we study sort of how they're using it and figuring out sort of where we can do, you know, do better. We need to sort of take that same approach to our staff. Um, uh, to reduce the 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 workarounds and and the failures of that technology, and so they they start to think uh, not just of the technology but the security um, that this is all um, there to frustrate them. Um, uh, and obviously, that's not our intention. I think, Mary, as you you mentioned, I mean, like we have lots of amazing, wonderful people in the community who are really trying to do their best, um, but they're stressed and and they need things to work. And and I again, I see this. Um, uh, again and again, as as uh, we we work, you know, sort of across the country, we see you know providers coming up with really cool solutions that work in in a lot of instances, but not in all the instances that their staff or their volunteers need. Um, so I think that's really important to uh, to managing um, security because if you're if they're using your systems and you control the system, you control that data. Uh, you control access. If they work around that system, um, then it's a much harder thing to to manage. Um, and we talked about starvation um, budgets, but you know, longer term um, budgeting so that you can take on those bigger projects and 
um, uh, and reduce those back burners. I, I, I hear that repeatedly about how many back burner projects um, people have that are that sound like they're really important and, and a lot of them have to do with security. Mary, anything to add on this one? I think just the, the, the risk and costs of old technology, I, that can also, one of the places that, that catches you is, and I don't think this is in any other slides, of the, your website. You have to register your domain, domain name. You have to have SSL certificates, and those things expire. Domain names expire, and one big risk is that's something you renew. You might renew it every year. You might renew it every three years, but if you have staff turnover, if you have IT turnover, that's not captured any place, and someday someone goes to your website, and it's not your website, or you can't connect to your web-based online intake because you haven't kept up that security certificate. That's the kind of stuff that you need to keep in your planning. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's some um, priority uh, uh, policies and, and practices, associated practices that um, we hope uh, uh, folks will consider. Um, uh, this is uh, um, sort of a uh, uh, an updated list of uh, priority policy areas. When we when we actually first started in uh, New York City on a project, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, we uh, come away from uh, working with uh, large law firms that had I don't know it seemed like a couple hundred um, different IT related policies and. Um, uh, and we we didn't want uh, to <laughs> so overwhelm folks. I think this list can be overwhelming um, if if you sort of um, uh, look at uh, standing on their own. But a lot of these policies sort of relate, and so the idea is to you know develop policies that that capture um, uh, these ideas, these issues, um, and and I think to the extent that that you do, and then and we're going to talk about sort of that that implementation piece. Um, uh, you'll be able to um, uh, be more confident in your planning and in your, in what you're budgeting for, that you're actually sort of taking care of those things that um, that the organization and its leadership I feel are very important. Um, so maybe, Mary, do you, I don't know if you want to start with uh, the, the personnel-related policies. And, and it's these are rough categories. So I just want everyone to understand it's it's not there's no sort of uh, clear demark uh, demark between you know the, the, the personnel and the data. Everybody you know they're sort of interrelated for sure. And one thing that we do with onboarding that, that's very helpful is we have we have an outsourced IT support organization. Our operations manager submits a, a user a new user form and she tests mm -hmm. the account before the user starts. So she makes sure that the password is what we expect the password to be, email, case management system, and it is helpful to the new user who comes comes on and their first day, everything works, which is very helpful. As part of that onboarding, once the user arrives, there's an orientation. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. This is why you can't do it. Um, offboarding is equally important, especially when you have that turnover in interns and volunteers. One thing that we are constantly asking for is what's the end date? What is this person's last day? And at 5.30 that day, that account password gets changed. Uh, one thing people think about the offboarding and end of, end of user cycle is, uh, well, I can't delete the account. No, you don't have to delete the account, but you do have to make it inaccessible. And the way the easy way to do that is to change the password so that if this happens a lot with volunteers they have saved a file someplace they shouldn't have saved it and their supervisor needs to get it deleting the account could do bad things to the user's private folder but just disabling access means that we can still get it if there's a business need and that ties into the security awareness training the first day this is this is what to look for. This is the kind of email you may get. This is something you may not see at home. The BYOD and BYOA, particularly also for uh, non-exempt employees, this is a wage and hours thing that you should talk to your per, you, your HR person about because non-exempt staff should not be required to check their email outside of hours. So there is a that there's an employment thing there. Do you want email on your phone? Our policy is it is not required. But if you are going to do this, you have to call me as soon as you lose that device so I can wipe it remotely. And 
there's no shame in it. Just you lost your device. That's, I'm sorry, but we have to protect our client data. Internet, social media, and email use. One thing that we hear a lot about just sort of gen generally is, you know, internet filters. If you're a domestic violence organization and you are doing research, sometimes the information your advocates are going to type in might be caught up by a filter. So a filter that might work in a regular business environment will not work for us. Yeah. And so Mary, just a little an an anecdote mm -hmm. on that one. So I, um, uh, one of the, the, the programs uh, uh, we were uh, visiting with this uh, past year has a designated um, uh, workstation in, in, uh, in, in their office that they can go to to do those searches. And um, and number of staff, when we sat down with them, were very, like, this is just so frustrating. Sometimes the computer's busy, but it's like, I just need to look something up. And so I've got to you know, go to a different floor, to a different part of the office to get access to that computer so I can do this research for my clients. So, yeah, it's it, it's a frustration that, that uh, rang uh, pretty pretty loudly, but it's also an understandable um, uh, you know, desire of the organization to put some filtering in place to, pr to provide a, a safe work environment for, for staff to potentially you know, reduce the risk of uh, malware from, from websites that are not um, uh, legitimate. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and so you know, this, this sort of goes to the design piece too. So if you're going to you know, build these policies, you need to have an implementation strategy that actually sort of brings your user's perspective um, into account, and and you come up with a solution that really fits, um, and makes it um, you know easier for people to comply. It makes it under, you know understandable why we're doing it, um, as opposed to you're just trying to make my life that's already difficult more difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I think having having these these policies, Mary, you mentioned the you know the onboarding um, uh, form. I mean, having a, a a policy about you know who has access to what, um, you know, an intern. Um, uh, is going to be the different classification that a staff attorney or a paralegal, um, and maybe you know, a grants manager is going to have different access than than your uh, a basic uh, grant accountant. Um, uh, so, making uh, some sense of this and um, and and putting this into policies, obviously these are um, more you know more generic than than the particular form, let's say. But but this is these are the goals for our policy. This is why we have it. And one um, thing that works. The one thing that works for protecting changes to your systems is, uh, and this is sort of uh, a standard system administration thing that can work not just with your network but with your your fundraising accounts and your grants accounts, any of your systems. It's for privileged users to have two accounts: the one they use to do their day-to-day mm -hmm. -day work which is, you know, that's my Mario account. That's what I do when I'm doing my reports and all that other. But if I'm changing something to a system, I have to log out and log in again with an admin admin account specifically so that I'm paying attention to the specific task I'm performing and then log out again. So that's not just a network admin thing. It can be your, your case administration if someone's making configuration changes to your fundraising software or to your donor management software. So... That's another way to protect the system, protect the data, and get your users to understand the impact of what they're doing. Right. And having, you know, like an incident re reporting and response um, policy, and obviously there's going to gonna need to be um, other forms and, and, and processes and people identified um, to manage that. But, like, that's, that's something that... Um, you know, to the extent that you you want to know how you're going to respond, because ultimately there's no there's no perfect security. Uh, I, there's no reason to think that that your firm is not going to be compromised at, at some point. But having had that time to prepare for, kind of like you're preparing for a disaster if you're living in a hurricane zone or in in earthquake zone or in the, in the wildfire zone, we're preparing for a, a security disaster. And so part of that is how do we respond? How do we um, uh, ensure that the, the the damage stops and that the the, the documentation occurs um, that that uh, you know that you know the proper authorities are, are um, uh, notified that the insurance provider if there is one is notified so on and so forth so that um, you don't compound that problem um, or that that breach by by having to sort of um, work out sort of what your response is and, and typically it's not going to be as good if it's a reactive um, response. Um, 
turning to privacy, I just um, sorry to to data and 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 privacy, but having um, you know, having an articulated privacy policy for client and staff data. I mean, we we probably all have one for our websites, um, but but do we have? Um, I haven't seen many um, uh, privacy policies for for you know client data and staff data. Um, policies on you know the data we collect and why and how who makes those decisions to collect that data. Mary, you've you've been um, a big proponent of of uh, data destruction, of not keeping everything um, uh, you know long term and 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 I got a you know second and third that because the less data you have, um, the less that can be compromised. Um, but uh, but having that destroyed properly. You know, as part of that, that, the policy is is critical. We're not just um, uh, you know uh, deleting files on a drive or or uh, or deleting records out of a database without getting to let's let's say the backups. You know, how do we make sure that we don't have backups of that data somewhere? And with database uh, deletions, you have to be careful about data integrity, referential integrity. If you can't delete right. a user without deleting their history, and some systems will not let you delete anything, which is is one way of dealing with the database architecture. It's not necessarily my favorite. And then yeah, users are always afraid that they're going to lose something they need. Sort of e-hoarding is a thing. And mm -hmm. no, you really do not need that sample brief that you wrote in 2003. I promise you don't need it. It can go away. So that there's there's an emotional reaction too when you start deleting stuff. Uh, so we've got a question here from the audience. Is and, there a good and retention. Source? So if you articulate a, uh, is there a good source to find best practices of policies and procedures that can be adopted for their organization? Where do you go um, to find those? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about the New York City project. Because, uh, I think it, it's a somewhat interesting evolved answer there. Um, there are um, uh, you know tools out there that. Um, kind of like hot docs light um, tools um, uh, uh, that that I played with. Um, one in particular, Instant Security Policies. Um, dot com, um, and uh, uh, you know it's not free, um, but obviously th these sort of uh, documents come at a cost to the provider to to maintain. Um, I I think. Um, and I, I, let me. I'll just sort of leave it there. I, I want to get get to that question at, when we get to the New York City project. Um, uh, if I may, is, is there any other other question at this point? Um, or, I, just a quick comment on the data destruction. Um, there is going to be a major session on data destruction at the MIE yeah. it, uh, conference coming up in January, and it is a huge problem in our industry. Some of the case management systems don't even have the functionality to properly delete things without going through them as admins, which causes a giant transactional cost and means no one is doing it in the industry. This is right. something that really needs to be addressed. Right. Well, and and I think on, on destruction as well. I mean, I think having well, um, so I was, I was going to say one of the things that 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 uh, where does it start? It starts um, at least from a client perspective with the retainer and having um, uh, sort of this uh, these policies identified, you know, developed and identified and shared with the client. Here's how we're going to treat your privacy. Here's how we're going to treat your data. This is what we're going to retain. This is for how long. And in, in an accessible language, um, uh, but that was sort of one of the, the things that um, a number of years ago, uh, working with uh, one of my board members, um, we were you know we we're looking at so how can we eliminate data sooner? And and one of the sticking points became the retainer. And so having a retainer that makes it clear, we will keep your data you know obviously through the representation and for another year or another two years. And at which point your data you'll, you're entitled to get your Back, um, and uh, and will otherwise be destroying it. Um, but the destruction piece. Um, so there are you know case management system challenge serious. Um, the document management uh, piece is is difficult um, in part because documents may live in multiple places. Um, but if we can get a handle on this is sort of where the basic technology uh, environment is so critical. If we can get a handle on our documents for um, knowledge management and production purposes. Typically, a lot of those more um, sort of sophisticated tools build in rule sets um, so that you can identify documents that should be set for archive and then should be set for destruction. So you're not spending a ton of staff time doing what we 
actually used to do in somewhat an easier fashion with paper case files. I, when I first got into legal legal aid, we had more significant case um, uh, paper case files, and and so things were sort of categorized by year, and then um, you know staff would go through it and pull out certain decrees, but then the whole file got shredded. Um, so we need a, a I agree a simple mechanism, um, and and we're going to sort of get a little bit to that a little bit later, and and. Uh, um, uh, and so, the, you know, the, the policies are great. It's it is certainly the the next stage is the is the implementation. Um, uh, I just wanted you know uh, point out that the the sanitation redaction is as sort of Mary um, sort of uh, you know and I were were uh, discussing in in this um, in preparing this presentation. I mean, there, we have a lot of funders and now an increasing number of partners, um, medical legal partners certainly, but but beyond that, where we're sharing data. Um, and so having a policy in place, so it's not just left to that particular partnership or collaboration. This is how we approach sharing of data. This is the data, again, these are our privacy policies for clients. So this is what we can and can't share without um, changing our policies or alerting our clients or alerting our staff. Um, it's, really, uh, it's really important that, we're, you know, that we have that sort of basic policy in place so that we know how to uh, handle those particular um, initiatives that uh, that that we're increasingly involved in. Um, uh, I, I mean, we're gonna. I think we should we should probably sort of um, Mary move fairly quickly through some of these. I mean, so there there are a lot of um, you know sort of basic um, security pieces. We you know Mary sort of spent a little time talking about the, the bring your own device. Um, uh, part of this or bring your own account, and so all these physical security uh, issues. Also, sort of um, hit on or are or, or, or of concern to um, personally owned um, uh, devices and, and controlled accounts. Uh, you know, uh, the, this you know onboarding, offboarding. You know, having that centralized user authentication, um, having you know with the fact that we have a lot lot more mobile um, staff and, and volunteers out in the field, making sure that that we've got sort of the security that they need, that they can authenticate. Um, uh, into um, the either cloud services or services that you're hosting um, uh, in your offices um, in a way that that doesn't um, uh, negatively affect security. Uh, encryption um, certainly, you know, it's it's a lot um, uh, you know sort of easier to do with with certain like operating systems now. You know, having it built in, but what needs to be encrypted? Um, you know, how can we communicate going through and, and deciding all these? You know. Um, uh, pieces at a policy level is that first step, um, and I'm going to sorry move on to sort of that, that policies into good practice, which is I, I think sort of really a little bit more what we um, uh, see as as uh, as an even bigger challenge, frankly. Um, uh, and uh, and I think yeah. So so sorry the the question you know in terms of like sort of model policies. Um, uh, if the policy is really, if you have a, a model policy, um, and, and some some programs have actually sort of suggested they just want to adopt that model, um, what um, what we've been um, sort of talking about, we'll be talking about two things in New York with this um, pro bono um, project that's been going on, uh, and initially what we were thinking was we were going to do just that, develop some legal aid specific. Model policies that that people could just sort of you know put their their name on and stamp it, um, and uh, two things sort of you know came out of that after after some analysis. One was that by by establishing these are the the model policies, we're essentially sort of making that the the industry standard. And so if organizations don't um, a adopt it and b follow those policies, uh, implement it, then there's an increased liability um, to the community. Um, and uh, and so that that could potentially be a negative. Um, uh, I, I'm somewhat persuaded by that. Um, I certainly you know the intention uh, of this project, this pro bono project, and um, uh, and I think generally of folks um, uh, in in IT and in uh, in legal aid is not not to increase the risk for um, for providers. Um, but I think the more pers go ahead. No, that, that's an interesting one, but do you think the risk is actually higher than what's currently going on, which is no one has policies and they're not doing anything? Well, the idea right, that right, right. if we create best practices and standards and then they don't follow them, that does create yep. risk. What we're doing now is putting our head in the sand and pretending like we don't have to do anything. Right, right. Sorry to push so, back so hard, but... No, no, uh, no, 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 please, no, I appreciate that. Um, so, 
we, we, I say the status, I'd say the status quo is not okay. I think we are at greater risk with the status quo. Um, it's sort of how do we get beyond that? And, and so wh what's, what's evolved and part of why this project has taken longer is that what we're, um, uh, doing, we're doing two things, um, in this project. And, and Kirkland is sort of taking the lead. There are a number of firms, um, actually, why don't I just sort of jump, um, uh, a number of, of sort of partners on this on this project, um, uh, and what what we're doing is um, uh, essentially providing sort of the legal basis for these policies. These are your risks. These are these are sort of the potential liabilities um, because it's targeted for legal aid law, lawyers and and law firms. Um, uh, this is what you need to manage. These are your obligations, and then uh, taking more of like a workbook approach. Um, uh, instead of giving you the text of the policies, giving you these are the considerations for your policies. Now you need to piece this together, kind of like th these are the Lego blocks, the pieces. Uh, you need to piece this together in a way that actually fits your practice, your culture, your firm, um, and uh, and I think in so doing. Um, you're building policies that have, I think, sort of um, greater resonance within the organization. Um, it makes sense. People get it. It has legitimacy. It's got that input um, from from staff. You know, why do we have this policy? If I don't believe in that, that policy, I'm probably a little less likely to um, be enthusiastically supporting it or helping others comply with it if I don't understand why we got to it. If you just adopted somebody else's policies, I think there's that legitimacy piece, but I think it's certainly the um, the, the priorities. They're, they're, you know, as I mentioned, we, you know, some of these large firms have a couple hundred policies in place, so where, what are the ones we're going to focus in on first? And uh, and certainly, we're, the, the workbook that's being developed is not going to have 200 areas. We're, you know, that, that, would, that would sort of, uh, we'd, we'd drown in all that. Um, but getting people to to uh, work on those policies and then take that next step, and that this is where the um, sorry the pro bono project is going to um, sort of move into once this this book is is put together, is we're going to work with firms. We're not going to do the all the work for them, but we're going to sort of be the the guides and helping them um, uh, uh, both sort of you know tailor policies to their organizations, you know building on those blocks. Um, and then help them identify those um, systems that n that need to be adjusted, that or that systems that need to be um, uh, purchased. If you know, if monitoring is part of it, or building an audit trail is part of it, or or longer term, a lot of these policies are going to take longer term planning. It's going to require that when we implement a new case management system, you know, the for instance that we just talked about is that we need to have the capacity to delete. Um, effectively uh, scrub the database of, of records that are are you know determined that you know that it's time to scrub, um, uh, and I think you know again what we were you know um, you know challenged by um, and and I I certainly have seen this too is is that we have you know to the extent there are policies a lot of these policies aren't um, uh, effectively implemented and and maintained. Um, and and so you know going into if, if you're going to implement these policies you know there is this commitment to budget it's a commitment to staff has, having like a designated if if you know for instance you have a, a data um, retention destruction policy who's responsible for that um, uh, and uh, and it's not um, it's actually in some ways it's 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 probably one of the more expensive pieces of IT. Um, you know, is the management of of these um, uh, of these policies because it does implicate the systems you use, um, you know, how you have to maintain them, and the people who need to uh, be trained to comply with that. So it's 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 pretty comprehensive. So I like the approach that you're taking, and I definitely think that it uh, hits on some of the larger challenges that we have in this community with not having strategic IT staff at the kind of management level because the type of implementation that you're putting forward really takes a dedication, not just from help desk, but from the organization systemically to make that happen. So mm -hmm. I like where you're going with it, but there's a lot of need, or there's a lot of barriers to the implementation that we need to work on yeah. as a community. And I think that scope is really important. I, in order to keep your staff from being overwhelmed and keep your executive team from being overwhelmed, you have to pick something. You have to prioritize it. This is the most important. Explain it. 
get by and ne- implement it, then go on to the next and the next and the next. Because if you try to do everything at once, people will flee from you. Right, right. And and you know I I think the um, I, I mentioned um, this uh, this program in, in Ohio that that was you know that had the um, the commitment and the leadership to offer security awareness training you know in person security awareness training to staff and um, you know like but it was sort of outside the context of this sort of broader you know policy that this is a requirement that that you know that that you're um, uh, Mary, as you as you mentioned, sort of that that large law firm where everybody is a member of the security team. You know, um, I don't know that 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 having that policy would have made the difference, but I certainly think it's it's gonna it's a cultural change that we need to make. Um, and then and then that training comes in the context of here's here's what's expected of us, and here's how we're gonna help you get there and support you in doing it. Um, because this is in addition to, you know, continuing to, un, uh, you know, sort of understand your client needs as they change, as this new new populations, new you know, new communities are emerging that need our assistance, or the law that's evolving, or new areas of the law that we're getting into. So, so we have all these massive amounts of um, of knowledge that we need to um, uh, develop and maintain. And I think along with that, we need to uh, not and. Frankly, it's not just security because security we're, it's security because we're using this technology, but there's that knowledge to use the technology well and maintain security. So it's 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 no small lift, um, and it's not. I think Mary, as you're sort of pointing out, it's not something you're going to do overnight. Um, uh, so if you can start, you know, somewhere with you know pick pick your policy priorities. I we haven't sort of gotten to that final. Um, uh, uh, version for this this New York pilot, um, but I, I'm hoping that we're going to sort of prioritize. If you haven't done anything, these are the first two policy areas, um, you know, that you should be looking at building. And and again, here are the considerations and 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 some of the components of a good policy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I wanted to I mean I, you know we we've been talking at <laughs> at folks. Um, uh, and, and so, wanted to open it up for uh, for discussion and and to uh, you, know, uh, you know learn from each other and try to um, you know answer any any questions folks have. Uh, so we had a question here from Molly French. Um, LSC I think requires um, uh, a period of time. I think she says ten years here um, to have data or hard copies or e copies. Is is this the case? And also, um, what uh, how do you deal with data that's needed for conflict checks with right. regards to data destruction policies? I, so I had reached out to OCE at LSC a number of years ago um, uh, uh, about keeping paper versus uh, digital, um, and they were very much open to keeping uh, digital uh, representations of the paper and not the paper. Um, but that's, I mean, you know, that that's a good question that, frankly, we we might want to ask as a community or ask NLADA to um, uh, uh, to talk with LSC about what's the, um, you know, we want guidance from them. We want to make sure that you know when it comes time to be audited that we've got everything, um, uh, you know, that, that they need. I, I I personally have been involved in some LSC audits where I've just provided them. You know, copies of of retainers and and attestations electronically, and they they never went through any of the paper. Um, uh, and you know, I, I think the other um, uh, you know you know question is has whatever their sort of position was has it evolved? Um, uh, certainly, LSC is doing more and more of their own work online, um, uh, so they they may have um, uh, they may have come along if if they've been a little bit more. Um, uh, behind the times. Uh, I'm sorry. In the second part of the question, <laughs> sorry, it was was there a second part? Did uh, I don't know if if starts muted. I think he's muted. Right. I was muted there. I was talking and didn't realize no one could hear me. <laughs> um, it was on uh, keeping information with regards to uh, conflict check. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. one of the things that I'm aware of there is that what you need for a conflict check is very different than what you need with their past case filings, their documents. There's a huge amount you can purge, but it's often state rules based. What other thoughts do you have on the conflict checks? 
Right. Well, Mary, you and I were talking about, for instance, the Social Security numbers um, mm -hmm. on this project. Right, because we have, at Her Justice, we've made a conscious decision not to collect social, full Social Security numbers. Um, so we can use date of birth and the last four digits. Um, right. We do have lots of clients with similar names, so that that's sort of where our that's where our unique identifiers come from. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I I think the conflict check. I mean, as far as I know, as long as you have attorneys who had access to that data, whether you you keep that data or not, you know, those those more senior attorneys that you're going to still have that conflict. Now, obviously, those ethical rules may may vary between states, but yeah, we have a long term need to maintain conflict um, data. But I think, yeah, Mary and I were just talking about that. You know, if if we collect less information that's um, particularly sensitive, or or a fragment of that more sensitive information, like the last four of the social security numbers, um, uh, that certainly helps. Um, and and yeah, and purging medical records, purging things that that if it, they get out, it would be potentially damaging, or or uh, uh, you know, or or even a, a safety threat. I mean, I, I think to some extent, sort of addresses, names, numbers of Relatives, um, you know, contacts where they might be living. You know, we, 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 again, it's sort of being um, uh, comprehensive in thinking through what's the data that we need and and why do we need it and how quickly can we get rid of it. But conflicts, I haven't haven't heard of a way to sort of just delete all the, all reference to a client or an opposing party. All right. Excellent. Um, there was a question here with regards to something Mary said earlier, um, which is uh, what are kind of the tips that you give to a client with regards to protecting their digital security online, especially if you've got a uh, DV survivor or someone who has the potential of being stalked or uh, found by the opposing party? Uh, a clear web cache. Um, that is something that if an attorney if one of our advocates finds that a, a client has a concern, I am happy to sit with a client. Um, this is, tell me what browser you use. I'm going to show you how to do this, and I will give you a screenshot. Um, and for a phone, I, I have sat with clients. Show me what you're doing on your phone, and I'll, and I'll show you how to wipe out the information. I, I think that one thing that I have been very lucky at at Her Justice is that I'm seen as a part of the whole team so that if a client has has a technology related question like that, I do get brought in, and it keeps me feeling like I'm part of the whole organization. It shows the client that we do have resources she may not have thought about, and she does get an answer. So, absolutely, so we take five minutes and show a client how to clear clear her browser because it's something that will help her in her life. Right. Uh, do you have a favorite so the New York City project? What? <laughs> well, I was just going to say that the New York City project. I mean, one of the you know the concerns uh, that it came up was was the you know the threat to client safety. Um, certainly, you know, uh, uh, persons who've been trafficked um, by organized crime. You know, so it's the risks are very significant, and uh, you know, and so you know, again, discussions about. Uh, and, this has come up um, in, you know, in the context of working with individual programs, like our communications with clients um, via text versus, let's say, WhatsApp or um, using Skype. I mean, what, you know, what are the uh, appropriate tools to secure those communications? Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I have uh, any great answers here, but I, I think, you know, together and and uh, you know, like sort of Mary being brought in and being part of sort of that the broader team and understanding the the needs and issues of the clients is so critical so that as she's uh, working and learning more and more about um, security or, or tech, tech, technology or risks you know then she knows what what to be looking for as well so it's really it's it's a it's a uh, um, what's the what's the uh, uh, the cycle the, the beneficial cycle it's a uh, well there's a, a term of art that I'm uh, a virtuous cycle as I think is the term right um, mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, so it, it really helps, um, uh, you know, again, part of planning when we're, when we're talking about sort of, you know, how clients access um, our services. Um, uh, uh, a, a migrant um, uh, worker program that we work with has um, clients that leave the country um, at various 
points during the year, and so communications are even more challenging, and security maybe even um, you know of greater importance. Um, and so knowing you know and staying uh, you know up to date, this let's say this um, WhatsApp is now um, uh, this version, um, or there's a vulnerability that hasn't been patched, so we should stop using it. Um, one of the things that actually came up again from staff was that a lot of the a lot of their clients don't have access to app stores. So if we think that, oh, well, there's this great security um, application that you can download to your Android or your iPhone, well, they don't have a credit card, so they don't have access to the app store. They can't download it. Um, or it takes more of an effort to get that software installed. So um, certainly being in the loop and then figuring out how we sort of cross that, that, uh, that challenge together I think really helps. And asking for help from your other partners. Uh, we have partnered with forensic accounting firms who – not don't necessarily do pro bono litigation, but they will help us with other things. And one of the, one of the things that comes up is that a client will have a series of threatening messages on her phone, and we want to preserve that as evidence. That is outside my capacity, but a forensic accounting firm knows how to do that and has that kind of tool. And so we will bring in a partner like that on occasion. Can you help us preserve this evidence? And and it's bringing more resources to bear. And it's another it's another way to get pro bono assistance from firms that are not legal, but who still want to help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I think security and privacy, one of the, um, uh, one of the things that comes up, you know, a lot of our clients uh, in the community you know, across the country use their phones to uh, record evidence, to you know, record documents, um, and so they're, you know, they're, that's great. There's this recording. It's potentially a risk, as as Mary sort of points out, with the you know the residue on their phones, the data on their phones. But but how do we get it? Um, uh, which you're sort of pointing to. And and if we just, you know, connect the phone up to our laptop, which is on our network, are we potentially compromising our network security? Um, because that phone may be compromised. Um, if we're backing up that phone, are we then taking everything from our client's um, phone and 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 logging it and recording it and storing it on our network? You know, stuff beyond um, you know the data that we're we're looking for. And so, you know, having these um, discussions again. I mean, I think going back to the policies that you know this this is the data that that we're you know getting. There's this business purpose or this representation purpose. Um, this is how we're going to handle it. It's going to remain encrypted. Um, uh, and when it comes time to implementation, then we actually sort of test it. Can we do this? Um, how how will we effectuate sort of that transfer of data from my client's phone to our our records, um, and not not go to a staff person's phone because then we just have the same same issue. Now it's that staff person's phone that we need to get the data from. Um, I, I think it's sort of another example where you know again the the planning. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a, a you know, again I think it could be any of any of our programs, but a, you know an IT team um, that was working on uh, on on uh, providing SMS messaging to um, to their staff because their their clients increasingly don't want to be um, talking on the phone. They have limited minutes, or or it's inconvenient because they're working during the day. They need to be able to communicate via text at night. Um, and so clients have um, uh, been typically communicating with um, advocates on their either their, their individual cell phone uh, numbers um, that they own or their personal Google Voice accounts or or the like. Um, and uh, and staff know this is just this is not what they want. They you know they're concerned about their clients. They're concerned about their own you know time and space away and and forget about the uh, exempt non exempt issue that they're very raised because that's an important one too. But um, uh, so so the, this IT department was about to um, uh, launch SMS messaging, but but uh, they they you know there wasn't enough communication. There wasn't enough collaboration to know that part of what's needed is the MMS messaging because they actually send photos and videos, um, and so again we've got to design you know sort of the the solutions to fit the need, and we really need to include staff with that so that we don't get 80% of what's needed, and then that remaining 20 necessitates the continuation of that that Google Voice account or that you know use of my personal cell phone. 
Uh, so a, another quick question here, um, and this is a pullback to what was being said about the bring your own device policies. A lot of programs have their own devices. And what are some of the things that you would recommend really seriously looking at? And how would you kind of reach out and educate staff over that with regard to the bring your own device policies? One thing that has worked for us is, is our main phone system is voice over IP, and we've upgraded it recently to include an app that essentially takes over the functioning of the staff person's phone so that they can make a call to a client or opposing counsel from their personal device, but it goes through our voice over IP app, and it, not, it does not expose our staff attorney's phone numbers. So... Now, that's a big project, getting a new phone system, but it has proven to be very helpful in protecting staff data. And it's everything that travels through this app looks like it came from the staff attorney's office. Mm -hmm. But there's a well, learning curve, and you have to open up the app to use it to make the calls that you want to make and protect, protect your own personal phone number. Right. Have the have the software installed and and logged in and everything. Yeah, it's it's uh, there's a cost to it for sure beyond just getting that technology. Um, I I would add you know again that it, it, going back to the policies, um, if you have sort of data policies that require, um, you know that if you have client data on your phone that the phone be encrypted, for instance, let's mm -hmm. say, um, you know that that it be erasable um, and. Uh, and now we have, um, you know, again, mobile device management. You know, 10 years ago was was really just in the in the realm of the large private law firm because it was so bloody expensive. I mean, I I wanted it 10 years ago, um, and we couldn't afford it. Um, uh, but if we, you know, if if we have again those policies, some of these, you know, the technologies that evolve um, are going to fit that policy are going to address that policy with less burden to our staff, which is ultimately our goal. We want to do the least to disrupt their advocacy, their service to clients, um, while maintaining uh, compliance with, with, um, you know, with basic policies. So MDM is, is now, you know, much more affordable, largely because it's all, well, it's not all, but it's significantly moved to sort of a cloud um, uh, offering and uh, and even you know you know Microsoft offers it at a discounted rate. A number of providers will will give nonprofits a, a discount on it. Um, so it's certainly I would you know I'd recommend first having the policies, but but having as as Mary said some ability to um, uh, mask your phone number. So using um, uh, uh, essentially you know your office phone number, whether it's a VoIP app or otherwise. There are other tools that. If you control a number, you're allowed to actually spoof that number legitimately. Um, uh, there are new phones that now allow you to have multiple. Not, this, this gets to be a little bit expensive, but you know, multiple phone numbers associated with the with the mobile phone. Um, I believe Verizon and T-Mobile have that. I think AT&T may. Um, uh, you know, so there the, again, that technology evolves. Having that policy is sort of that starting point, and uh, and then working to make it more affordable and um, usable is is sort of the IT's job. Uh, we're we're down to about the last five minutes here. Um, our um, we have went through all of the questions that are here. Um, are there any? Uh, last pieces of advice or uh, places that you really want to send people. We will definitely make sure that a copy of that New York report gets into the blog. Oh, perfect. Uh, if, you, if you would like to talk about these, that's great. Well prepared. Yeah. Um, well, Mary, I, if you want to go first, the, your, your favorites. Uh, Sands is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm in there all the time. Ooch. Oh, sorry about that. Didn't catch that. Um, and IT Toolbox has a lot of really accessible things for IT staff at all levels of security experience and background. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, so the the U.S. government, U.S. cert, um, their their tip sheet. Um, you know, I think you know again very approachable. They have um, a number of these sites. Both give you you know sort of examples of of compromises things. You know, so if you're wanting to share with your staff, like send out like a weekly, you know, reminder of the risks are real and and relevant. Um, I think that can be really useful. 
Um, I mean, we don't want to scare people to the point where they, they, they are not able to act, but I think uh, getting people to sort of understand um, sort of their role in security, I think, is an important um, thing for us to do in management and IT. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I, I think sort of uh, the, um, the CISsecurity.org, um, uh, actually was the, the founder was a former NSA um, uh, a person who, you know, again, you know, takes an approach of, le of less is more, like let's, we need to do these sort of basic um, uh, policies or, or, or address these basic security threats first. And so they have a top 20 list. Um, so that's a really good one. Um, uh, the uh, uh, and some of the some of the sites uh, naked security um, uh, you know again it's 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 very approachable um, I think it it's um, their con it's content you can share with your um, your colleagues who may not be um, uh, uh, sort of familiar with a lot of the terminology um, and uh, and so making this accessible especially if it's going to be you're going to be building a collaboration um, a culture um, it can't just be um, IT alone by any means. Um, and certainly, I think getting you know if you can get your executive director to sit down with you um, uh, and uh, and and uh, you know attend a, a, an area you know sort of security you know briefing um, or or you know go to the ITC conference um, or watch a webinar and and discuss it and and localize um, start that conversation I think. Um, it, you know, we need the leadership involved. Um, I think Mary, you'd mentioned uh, we had talked about sort of the, you know, the, the potential for board members to be involved. A lot of our board members mm -hmm. are from private law firms that are addressing um, security issues um, because they see big liability attached to it. Um, uh, so we we should be looking to build more pro bono involvement um, from the private bar, um, and uh, to some extent, I think from from uh, the academy as well. I think you know, law schools. Um, certainly are concerned about this stuff, um, uh, but but it, it you know start somewhere, you know find the tools. Um, uh, fi I'm sorry, find the sites that 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 you know that you can relate to that you think your users, um, your leaders can um, uh, can benefit from, and start talking about it. Talk about it, and people people will listen because they they see the impact in their daily lives. Yeah. Yeah, and I think every advocate cares about their client's safety and well-being, and and uh, and their own records. Like we, you know, we're not just talking about clients; we're talking about your data. We want to protect mm -hmm. your social security number, your date of birth, um, uh, your personal uh, uh, health information, um, and so we've got to do it together. Yeah, to, to add my favorite uh, resource there, um, we worked with Joshua Pesky out of Tech Roundtable last year. Um, he did a 10 part series on how to become a cybersecurity ninja. Yes. Um, we took that whole series, put it up on our YouTube channel, and it includes uh, kind of a, a test at the end. Um, but they each cover different topics, like bring your own device policies or social media or working with clients. Um, and it, it's a good seven or eight hours of free content that's out there. Um, nice to cover over a lunch hour, and uh, especially if you can do it with someone else that has different background and then talk to them about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Ask them questions. If things in there don't make sense, either shoot um, us over at LSNTAP a question and we're happy to help because uh, this is one of the most important areas to our clients and we see the biggest potential for harm and the need to really step up the community's game here to protect our clients. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you so much to John and Mary. Um, please, uh, I'll be sending you guys also directly our RFP, but there were so many different topics here. Several of the things that we covered briefly, I would love to see one or two of them as full longer webinars uh, next year because there's so much going on in the community you can do so much here. Well, and I, I'm really, I mean, I was hoping to have this uh, this workbook done um, before this uh, this webinar, and I've I've seen um, some drafts, and so it's it's we're making progress, but uh, um, but I'm I'm certainly so not not for ITC this year, um, but I'm certainly hopeful in in the uh, in, in 2019 that we'll be able to share it out. I've already been you know talking with uh, um, uh, the City Bar and and uh, the partners about you know making this a national. 
uh, resource that that can be you know improved upon as as a uh, as a you know, shared tool. Yeah, as soon as it's available, we're happy to blog about it, share it, and do another webinar kind of highlighting what's there and walking people through it. It sounds wonderful. Great. Excellent. Thank well, you, Mary. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.